Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Worship at Central is a time to be with God. A time to celebrate with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. A time to celebrate the Word. To celebrate in song. To celebrate in praise. Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world.
morning, Central Church. Can everyone hear me over all the fans? Yes. Okay, good, because we're not turning them off. <laughs> and my hair, by the end, is going to be like... But we're all right, because we're here. We are here in the household of God. We are here in the community of faith to worship together, to sing together, to pray together, to listen for God's voice together. If you feel the need to spread out because of the heat, there's plenty of room. Please do. We don't need anybody keeling over. All right? If you are feeling a little overcome with heat, wave your hand and Usher will come help you. Um, get to a cooler place or bring you a glass of water or something. All right? Ushers are paying attention today. It is a good thing to be together, no matter the weather to worship God together. May the Holy Spirit fill us, fill this time together, fill this place, fill our worship with grace and peace and power. Oh, one more thing. They're not here, but Chuck and Margaret Loudon are celebrating 78 years of marriage this week. Right? Um, so if you see them, wish them felicitations and greetings. If you don't see them accidentally, why don't you make a point of sending a card or making a call this week? Because that is something amazing and wonderful to celebrate. Good morning. I'd like to... Uh especially welcome those of you who are worshiping with us via TV or internet this morning, um, and also those of you who are here on this very hot Sunday. Um, glad to have you all here. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, today, after the service, the two cents per meal deal will be collected. This is, collection is to help with our Thursday community meal, which is also known as Shepherd's Supper. Um, also, still can use some help and volunteers with the Summer Cafe Light. If you can help with providing the setup, the coffee, or some refreshments, please sign up in the Welcome Center or talk with Sue Driver. Um, June 3rd, next Friday, is the deadline to sign up for the Phil's Chicken House Chicken for our church picnic, which will be on June 12th. Um, there is a form in your bulletin this morning, so if you're interested in having chicken at the picnic, fill out the form and put it in the offering plate or leave it in the office. Um, there are still media surveys at the doors. If you have not filled out the survey yet, I hope you will do that. Um, you can come, after you've completed the survey, put it at the box at either of the entrances. And there are BMETS tickets for Thursday, June 23rd, available in the church office. It's United Methodist Night at the ballpark that night. And uh, there will be a tailgate party here at Central's parking lot at 5 p.m. before carpooling to the game. Um, you do need to get your tickets by June 16th. Um, also, um, and this is a change from what's in the bulletin, the book study will not meet tomorrow night. And to continue our worship this morning, let's join in the call to worship that is in your bulletin. Let us rejoice, for morning has dawned. A new day has been born and we are newly alive to enjoy it. We know the beauty of God's creation and the wonder of the human family. We remember those whose love has shaped our lives and those whose struggle for justice has been unsleeping even in night times or loneliness. We gather in our church to worship God, to share prayers and gifts, to pledge ourselves to God's work in the world. May God bless us so that what we do in this time together may be honest, sacred, and filled with hope. Let us pray together. Holy One, 
God of blessing and God of our most difficult times, we come to you for a moment of quiet in our self-made busyness. We come to you for energy in our weariness. We come to you for challenge when we are willing to settle for our own small plans and dreams. We long for the peace of your presence, even as we are afraid of the urgency of your call. Spirit of God, enter into each of our lives and enliven us. Enter, Spirit of God, into our community and enable us to love and serve you and all your children. Amen. And let's stand now, if you are able, and join together in song number 512, verses 1 through 4. whether you like to shake a hand or give a hug, or maybe you prefer not to, let's greet each other in Christian love. I know some of you are here. Come on up. Come get, I see you right here. You were the first one here. We have some other ones between church. Hi, guys. We're a nice little crowd up here, aren't we? Mm. So I got a question for you. Bailey! Bailey! So, I have a question for you today. You know, every week, when you guys are not here, you're usually off having fun with Miss Shannon and Miss Sarah. Um, I ask a question of the grown-ups, most weeks. And that question is, can you tell me where you have seen God working this week in your life? Do you think that's a good question? Yeah? So I want to ask you this week, where have you seen God working this week? What? Hmm? At your house? Mm hmm Okay. Where? In what way? To help you be good to your parents. That's, that's good. Where else have you, where have you seen God at work this week? Hmm. Sometimes it's hard to think about, isn't it? We don't usually think about stuff like that, do we? Have you seen God at work this week? Maybe in someone who loves you very much. Maybe you see God's love in the way someone loves you, your parents. Or in the way you see someone... Did you see, did you see anybody help someone else out this week? Do something nice for somebody? Maybe that's God's love working that way. Do you ever think about that? Sometimes we don't think about stuff. You guys and these guys too. Sometimes we forget to, 
to look at something and see where God is in it. And I think that's an important thing to learn how to do, whether you're your age or whether you're your age or your age or your age. It's a good thing to say, where is God in this moment, Carson? Maybe God would see you better if you sat up. Maybe. Do you think you can do that this week? Maybe look for where God is working in your life, where you see someone helping. If you see someone loving or helping or being nice or kind, maybe you can say, oh, I see God's love in there. I see God's love in that minute. Don't you think that's a good thing to look for? Too many of us walk around looking for bad and grumpy things. Maybe we should look for God things. Good idea? Good idea? Yes. So would you like to pray before you go sit down? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to, anyway. All right, can you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for all our days. Help us remember to look for you everywhere and every time. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up.
Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 97, found in the Old Testament on page 551. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around God. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of the Lord's throne. Fire goes before God and consumes adversaries on every side. God's lightning light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountain melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens pro proclaim God's righteousness and all the peoples behold God's glory. All worshipers of images are put to the shame. Those who make their boasts in worthless idols, all gods bow down before God. Zion hears and is glad, and the towns of Judah rejoice because of judgments, O God. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord loves those who hate evil. The Lord guards the lives of the faithful. The Lord rescues them from the hand of the wicked. Light dawns for the righteousness and the joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O righteous, and give thanks to God's holy name. And at this time, we will have our morning offering. If you're a guest here this morning, please don't feel obligated to put anything in the offering plate. We feel that your presence with us is already a gift.
come from you, O oh God, and of your own have we given you. to you, offering ourselves, our money, our time, our service, in grateful thankfulness for everything you've already given to us. Amen. And would you remain standing and let's join in singing song number 608. This is the Spirit's entry now. special joys and concerns as we pray for each other in our congregation. In the hospital now, um, Dan Hungerford is now at Strong Memorial, and there has been a special GoFundMe uh, set up on the internet if you'd like to make a contribution to help, um, or if you'd like to just make a contribution and do it, uh, talk to Pat in the office to help with medical bills. Um, people who are in our regular members yearly prayer program, we're recognizing in prayer now Richard Bagnick, Michelle Butler, Shannon Decker, Craig and Amy Gardner, Gary Holmes, Jerry and Jack Hotchkiss, David and Sharon Kresge, LG Minor, Katie and Adrian Rodriguez, Linda Struble, Heather and Derek Warden. And among our church family and friends, special prayers today for Jean Oney, so glad to see her here this morning. Wyatt Roberts, Tyler Wolford, Georgia Toth, and of course our homebound members. And special prayers as well for our Upper New York Annual Conference attendees. So I asked the children, and you probably saw it coming when I did, where has God been at work in your life this week? 22, what, 22 years married. Congratulations. You got you to gotta run to catch up with Chuck and Peg, though. <laughs> Dogwood trees, yes. I, you know, I saw bunches this weekend too. I thought they were amazing.
holding a new granddaughter, baby, baby. Granddaughter holding her baby. Sweet. Yes. A healed relationship that she's been praying for. According to Bruce, God's hand is in the fact that the cubs are still in first. Some of us find our religion in different places. And we are glad you're here. He's, he's thankful that God has allowed him to come and be present in this place again since he's moved to New York and grateful to see God's hand in all the help his family received when his mother died. And grateful to be here today. So we're grateful for you to be here today, too. Other celebrations, other places where God has touched you this week. Jean. I can't hear over the fan, so. Jean's surgery went well, and she's here to tell the tale. And probably has about 50 times today already. God is with us in every moment, in everything we do. Sometimes we notice and sometimes we don't. Let us be in prayer together. Holy and loving God, we are grateful people. Grateful for all the ways that you are at work in our lives. Through the love and kindness of the ones around us, through the love and kindness of strangers, through the love and kindness we see in each other's eyes, we see you. We are grateful because our lives would be vastly poorer without your presence. We are grateful that you touch the lives of those around us who need your help, who need your comfort, who need your strength. And sometimes you do it through us. And we are grateful for that too. Holy One, we ask this morning your presence, your power, your purpose, your passion that we might live as your disciples in this world, that we might live full of your fire, your spirit, that we might live in such a way that those who see us see you. When we falter, strengthen us. When we lack courage, fill us to the brim. When we are timid or tepid, Fire us up, because your world is waiting for your love and your grace. Your world is hungry for your purpose. Help us to live it with all we see in all we do. Help us live it in the lives of others around us. We've prayed for some already. Some who need your comfort or your strength. We need healing of one kind or another. We pray it especially this morning for those who grieve losses of servicemen and women in their families. Heal the aching hearts of those who grieve the ones who never came back. We pray also for all those we carry in our own hearts, friends and family, loved ones, neighbors. Hear us as we lift those names into this time and this place. You know each story, each life, each name. 
Okay, we ask it anyway. Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. For we ask each one in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us first how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The second scripture reading comes to us from Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 16, and continuing through 34. And this is a translation from the message. One day, on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic, and with her fortune telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, these men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until Paul, finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her, out, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And it was gone just like that. When her owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into a court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators, subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob had Paul and Silas's clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jail keeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamping leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were a prayer and sang in a robust hymn to God. Then other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway when Paul stopped him. Don't do that. We're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved to really live? They said, put your entire trust in the master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out in detail the story of the master. The entire family got in on that part. They never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, dressed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning was baptized, he and everyone in his family. There in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. So what's your faith story? Don't say you don't have one. 
Everyone has one. Maybe yours starts with family, a mother or a grandmother sharing their faith with you. That's my story. Maybe it starts somewhere else in another time or place. Maybe you don't, at this point, recognize it as a story of faith. Maybe it's more like a journey or a question or a seeking. You've heard these faith stories that your friends have shared over the past month or so. Every one of them is different. Each person's journey is different from each other person. You probably do have a story in you somewhere, but you may never have articulated it before. It's not something we're used to doing, really. I'm not sure why. As a culture, we're really ready to share all sorts of private stuff all over the place, often with complete strangers. Who has never had the experience of being helplessly trapped near someone who's spilling his or her guts on their cell phone? Anybody never had that experience yet? I'll hook you up if you like. Seriously, I have heard more medical conditions intimately described in ghastly detail than I can count. I have heard more foul or sexual language out of teenagers than I could even repeat anywhere. I've even heard someone talking about an extramarital affair on a cell phone in public. They think we can't hear them just because they're not paying attention to us. It's like being a small child who closes their eyes and says, you can't see me. <laughs> People put things out there that I wouldn't be comfortable saying to my closest friends. I imagine that relationships are broken every day over those kinds of things. The point being, if we as a culture are so willing to talk about almost anything, in front of other people, often in excruciating detail, why are we not so willing to talk about faith? Probably because we think other people will think we're nuts. Or like Heather, we're nervous. Take the first part of the scripture story today. Paul and Silas are preaching in Philippi, having found a home base at Lydia's house. You heard about Lydia a few weeks ago. And there is this young woman who keeps following them, proclaiming to anybody and everybody who they are. Obviously, Paul and Silas consider her to be unbalanced. She's got to be nuts, right? Because public displays are always suspect. And because this could get them run out of town. So naturally, assuming that anyone making that kind of disruption is, of course, demon-possessed, they cast it out of her. I would love to do that with one of those folks on the cell phones. Turn around and cast out the demon. That was funny. Are you all just wilted? <laughs> well, anyway, doing this gets Paul and Silas severely beaten and tossed in jail, locked in the stocks. They have messed with this girl's owners. They have dried up their income stream, which is a bad idea for tourists to do. But they don't take it as a setback, they take it as an opportunity. They begin to express their faith out loud. They sing songs to God right there where everybody can hear them. And people do hear them, and they do believe, and they join Paul and Silas in baptism. Their lives are transformed in these moments of public display. Can we relate to that at all? today in 2016, sharing our faith out loud into a microphone maybe, in city streets, in troubled times. One of the great threats in seminary at Drew was, or not threats, but sort of uh, anecdotes that ha got handed down through the generations was, you better be glad you weren't here when I don't even know what his name was. Uh, the preaching professor was here because he would take his students to New York City and give them a box and stand them on a corner and make them preach. Who? David Randolph. Did you have David Randolph? Did he make you stand on a street and preach?
dodge that one. <laughs> We can't relate. You know, seminary students now breathe deep sighs of relief because, you know, go back to the whole people will think we're nuts idea. But as I think about it, I'm not exactly sure why we let this stop us. We do nutty things all the time publicly. There's always that one family member, right? Maybe it's you. What public displays of oddness have you participated in at one point of your life or another? If you can't think of any recently, think back to high school. You did weird things in public. You know you did. Oh, yeah. What might it mean to do such a counterculturally different thing as to talk about our faith? Let me ask that another way from the backside. What does it mean if we never talk about it? For one thing, think of all the children we celebrate here each week. Next Sunday is a Sunday devoted to the children's program, the education program here, celebrating the children of this church. Think about all those children, from the oldest to the youngest, from the ones who've been here their whole lives to the, the brand new baby ones we baptize. If we never talk about our faith, they will grow up thinking of church as a, a Sunday morning club they can just as easily do without when something more interesting comes along. If we, if we, we, meaning y'all and me, never talk about why worship is important to us or why the community of faith is important to us, they will never know. It's not like our culture's telling them, because it's not. If we don't share the story of our faith with our children, or with our nieces and nephews, or with our grandchildren, or our great-grandchildren, or any of the other children in our lives, how will they know what faith is? How will they ever learn to articulate it for themselves? It's not just up to Sunday school teachers or the pastor of a church to do that. That's like saying kids should only ever learn ABC and 1, 2, 3 in school by qualified teachers. We don't do that. The things of faith, they are deeply personal. But they are not and should not ever be embarrassing. They are not and should not ever be a secret. but we treat it like that. I find that people are as reluctant to talk about faith with their children as they are to talk about sex or money. Wouldn't you rather they learn it from you than from the first televangelist they come across? Wouldn't you rather they learn about faith from you than from someone who tells them what they must believe and when? Wouldn't you rather the children around you and in your life learn about faith from you than from someone who will beat them up in one way or another out of the rigidity of, of their extreme interpretation of faith? Which way would you rather the children you love learn about faith? What we hear in Paul and Silas' story is that they're not afraid to talk about their faith no matter the circumstances. This whole collection of Paul's letters in the New Testament is his spiritual autobiography laid out for everyone to see. His story of faith, the when and the where. He talks about the things of God. What happens when we're bold enough to speak, when we're bold enough to tell our story, is that we find people will listen. People are hungry to talk about spiritual things. We're just all generally afraid to. Now, by this, I do not mean going out on a street corner to harangue passers-by to repent and accept Jesus now, which I'm sure Professor Randall did not have you do. No. That is not what I mean. Remember, they cast a demon out from a girl who did that in this story. I also do not mean presenting your theological landscape as the only belief system possible and beating up on those who disagree with you. 
This is also what I do not mean. We have plenty of so-called Christians doing that already. Have I mentioned General Conference lately? Ouch! I'm hot. <laughs> what I mean is speaking about our faith as we do about the other important things in our lives. It doesn't have to be complicated or elaborate. It doesn't have to be eloquent or preachy or theologically expansive. It just has to be you. Your story of you and God and your faith. Just like your friends at Central have been doing in worship each week. And I am so grateful for their willingness and their bravery in doing that. Paul's story starts as being an observant Jew persecuting Christians and continues with meeting Christ in a blinding vision and having his life turned upside down. The slave girl's story in this scripture starts with being freed from captivity to forces beyond her control. The jailer in this story, his faith story, starts with an earthquake and a prison break. Everyone's story with God starts somewhere. And it needs to be told. So think about it. Try it out on yourself. Then tell someone, anyone, why it matters to you. Faith stories are not some dull, dry thing to be locked up in an ancient book we only bring out on Sunday. They are real. They are alive. And they are meant to be shared. Because God is in them and in the telling. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. We're going to sing again. Oh, let's just do the first and last verse. I know, they love it when I do that. Nate's coming, it's good. First and last, stand in body or spirit or both. We are not perfect people, not one of us, but God is with each one of us and in each one of us and can be through each one of us if we are brave enough to speak about it. As you go into this week and into this world, may the Spirit of Christ fill you. May you tell your story in one way or another. If necessary, use words. Go and may the peace and the strength of Christ go with you. Amen. Amen.